Isaiah 46 to 48. Chapters 46 through 51 include what we call oracles against the nations. We've seen this kind of literature in uh, Isaiah, uh, Amos. We saw the entire books of Obadiah and Nahum, for example, be these oracles against nations that are not Israel. And so uh, this is chapter 46 is an oracle against Egypt, 47 against Philistia, and 48 against Moab. Um, imagine, a, again, the audacity of how this would have sounded to the earliest ear, because we have a God who is, I know that we put him here, but in the picture of the average mind of the ancient Near Easterner, think of what has just happened. Jerusalem has been sacked, uh, Judea has been destroyed, Babylon has come in and wiped it out completely over the course of several years and now finally devastated the land. And then the God of that land says, oh, by the way, I'm in charge of the world. That's why it's so odd. And so these kinds of oracles, uh, very strong, basically God saying through Jeremiah that they will pay for their disloyalty to Yahweh uh, over time. Now let's add to our discussion then, again, this word that sovereign sovereignty. Did I spell that right? I believe I did. It's not, a th it, 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 it's not a biblical word. There's no Greek or Hebrew word that matches this, but this is a theological term that we've come to describe when it comes to God's control over the world. It's an uncomfortable word and one that causes division among Christians. And well, so it should. Think of the, shall we say, the easiest things that gods, not just our God, but all gods of the ancient world claimed to control. One, one of the most common is rain, famine, uh, crops, and things like that. Um, think of how difficult that would be to control that. There may be, again, we don't know how that would work, I suppose, but it's just laws of nature. It's just uh, heating and cooling and uh, humidity and, and air and water and all that kind of thing. So in one sense, it's the, it's the one end of the spectrum, the easiest uh, idea of a God controlling the human race or affecting the human race. Now think of what we've just heard in these oracles. I'd recommend this is the other end of the spectrum because this is not just saying that God will punish nations. He is saying that he has the right because he is sovereign to control the outcome of people within these nations and even the leaders, the kings and the princes and such. Listen to how this was described just a few chapters earlier, for Jeremiah 42, 11. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon whom you fear. Do not be afraid of him, declares Yahweh, for I am with you to save you and to rescue you. So again, this is Yahweh claiming to be in control of a man like Nebuchadnezzar and his entire army and his entire country. 43.10, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I am sending my servant, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Here he claims, let's make this um, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, God actually can call him his servant because he will send him in this verse to uh, defeat Egypt in a certain battle. Again, Jeremiah 43.12 and 13, I, Yahweh, will set fire to the temples of the gods of Egypt he, Nebuchadnezzar, will burn them down and carry them off. The I and the he are interchanged because, again, think of what the argument of sovereignty says. As uncomfortable as it is, God is claiming that he can use someone. I am doing it. Well, he is doing it because these two, even when he's not a worshiper of Yahweh, God can use a person to do something. So I'd recommend these are the two ends of the spectrum. And, and I'm not saying that sovereignty is a simple doctrine. By, by no means is it simple. But we all believe, because we believe the Bible, that we have to include on the one end of, shall we say, difficulty for God to control things, to do things, to have power over things. We have rain, wind, and, and water. On the other end of the spectrum, and again, we have to believe it because it's in the text, we have God saying that he is not only uh, going to hold nations accountable, he will use nations against each other. He has that kind of power in his sovereign rule to control individuals, countries, and in fact, the gods of the countries. And this is something we don't want to miss because like in our reading today in 4625, these are... This is the argument against Egypt, what God says against them when he claims he controls the god of Ammon, the god of the sun, the god No, who is the god, the, the village god of the, of, of the city of Thebes, 
and also the Pharaoh. So God says, I have not only control of the people, but I have control of the gods who control, in some sense, the people. In 48.7, we have, um, talking about Moab, um, uh, Yahweh mentions how Chemosh will be under uh, punishment because of God's power again. So, as we stand here, let's say, and we're looking up into um, our, our, uh, our, our heavens at night, and we worship the God who created and sustains all things. We don't have to understand sovereignty. I, that, you know, obviously the human mind, I, I don't think, can. However, what I'd recommend based on our text like this one today, we have to admit that something is going on, that God controls not only the rain, and we can pray to a God who controls the rain, but he also controls to some extent the people who inhabit the earth with us. We can pray to God, and, and, and I just always, as I've said probably before, listen to your prayer life and watch how often you ask God to, well, not to control, not to force, not to coerce, but to move people to do things in your own life um, around you. And when I say the word move, notice how tricky that word is. Not in, and again, I don't understand how it works. But uh, this is something that we don't have to understand again. But I'd recommend over time as we grow in the story of Scripture, we begin to feel more comfortable with realizing that God is in control of both ends of this kind of spectrum. Mm -hmm.